The book of Exodus was written by Moses sometime between 1440 and 1400 BC. The story follows Israel's time in Egypt and their journey to the Promised Land. Exodus picks up 400 years after Genesis, where Abraham's family has grown into a people now called Israel, living as slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh. In the midst of a decree to wipe out the Jewish people altogether, we're introduced to Moses. God appoints him as leader of the Israelites, the one to lead them out of bondage. God sends a series of 10 plagues over Egypt as divine justice against Pharaoh. And even after allowing the Israelites to leave, Pharaoh sends an army to capture the Israelites. God miraculously parts the sea for Israel, delivering his people. From here, the Israelites begin to wander in the wilderness. They quickly forget their deliverance from their oppressors and complain against God, yet God responds with mercy and provision. The people encamp at the foot of Mount Sinai where God invites Israel into a new covenant with him to establish a standard of living for the people. Through obeying these laws, Israel will become a nation set apart to represent God to the world as promised to Abraham. God extends this incredible access to himself, but Israel ignores God, choosing their own path. In Exodus, we see God's miraculous efforts to free the Israelites from hunger, slavery, their own wandering, and ultimate genocide. However, God is faithful to his promises, even when Israel rebels again and again. You know, we are all totally aware of the impact that COVID has had on our community and our country and our world. It is kind of weird living in these kind of crazy times, these crazy days. As you looked at this week as the beginning of school and you saw the pictures of our children out in front of school buses and on their porch, you noticed that they were wearing masks or maybe they were learning from home this year and decided to uh, stay at home for in-home learning. We, we are seeing the impact of what happened to us in March. For some, you've lost family and friends or you at least know people that have had this virus and, and got on the other side of it. But work has changed for you. It's work has changed for us. It's, it's eating out has changed. Going to the store has changed. Honestly, it seems like everything has changed. Our rhythms have changed. And what I've noticed is that when our rhythms change, it brings a, a element of frustration. We are used to certain patterns and certain ways of doing things. And, and when those things change, it bothers us. We're people of ritual. I mean, as today is, and in, in we look into the where we sit in our own homes, and when we where we go to our office, or if there's a favorite place where you eat, and there's a booth or a table that you like, we we are people of ritual. And when our rituals and when our rhythms get changed, when our rhythms are not the same, we begin to go a little haywire. And this isn't really new. I mean, people throughout time have had this. This is we're not just special or soft. This is the way it is for everybody. When we look back, there was an invention that happened all the way back as early as the 300s in China. But it was really kind of came to light for us here in the United States back in 1988. The stress ball. Alex Carswell, a 29-year-old TV writer, came up with the idea and made it happen. After he was on an, a phone call that was not going his way, he became angry with his boss. And he picked up an item, a magic marker, and he hurled it across the room and hit a picture of his mother. Moms, I'm sorry. Sometimes you receive the brunt of our hostility when our rhythms, because you are the one that always fixes them. But in his stress and his frustration, he picked this item up and he throws this marker across from me. He hits this picture and he decides that what if there was something that people could squeeze, they could hold on to when they're angry, when they're frustrated, when things aren't going their way. And since the stress ball was created and we, we have them in our offices, we have them at your homes, maybe even in your car, it's something to squeeze, to hold on to, or maybe even throw. We all deal with stress we all deal with stress differently. 
This past week, we were in a staff meeting and talking about this, and the question came out, how do we handle this? And, and the, the answers were all, all over the room. There, there were people that just completely shut down, and they just said, I, I kind of go into my own cave when I get too overwhelmed, too overstressed. I just want to hide. And, and others said, I, I go to sleep. I want to take a nap. Or others said, I start eating. And, and some said, I just kind of put my head down, and I just push through and, and just kind of ignore anything going on around me. But stress comes at us. When our rhythms have changed, our, our stress comes at us, and it, it's got to make its way out. So here's what I'd like you to do. In your rooms, in your, in your homes, or if your office, or if you're by yourself, please jump online now with the host and take two minutes and talk about this. What has been the biggest rhythm change in your life since March 2020? And it can be either good or bad. Maybe there's some good things that have happened, but maybe there's been some bad things. But what is the biggest rhythm change you have had since March of 2020. Take two minutes now and talk about that. See, stress is a feeling of emotional or physical tension. It, it's, it's emotional and physical or, or maybe one or the other, but it can come at us from any event or thought that makes us feel frustrated, maybe angry or nervous. Stress is our body's reaction to challenge or demand. When, when, when we feel that pressure upon us, it's a challenge or something that is being requested of us that we may not be prepared for. Now, in short burst, stress is not necessarily bad. In fact, it can be positive. As our college students are heading back in the next coming weeks, there's going to come a moment in time this semester that at some point in time around midnight, they're going to go, I got a paper due at 8 a.m. And they're going to work feverishly to get that paper done. That stress, even though it's uncalled for, is not bad because it is a pressure that applies to them to get it done and knock it out. See, stress in short bursts, it can help us avoid danger. It helps us meet deadlines. It can make us make life decisions and changes to our life. But when we don't handle stress properly, when we don't handle it properly, we get all kinds of issues. In fact, we can have health, issue, health, health, health issue, issues. It, it can create anxiety or depression. Um, it can actually change some of the rhythms of our heart. There, there are issues that happen when we don't deal with stress properly to our health. Physically, we can make us do all kinds of things. We can, we can either overeat or undereat. We can sleep too much or not get enough sleep because of worry and fear. Our body can literally begin to shut down on us. It, it begins to hurt or ache, and we begin to have physical issues that we didn't know we had. Emotionally, 
It, it creates worry. And then it can even create bitterness over our situation. We begin to dwell upon what's causing the stress. And it can, we can begin to foster an attitude or a heart issue of bitterness. And bitterness is dangerous. John Orberg Jr. says this, Bitterness is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. Eventually, bitterness will kill us. Hear me. Eventually, bitterness will kill us. Either physically, because it can contribute to all kinds of physical sickness and illness like we talked about, or spiritually, by not allowing us to experience the peace that God wants for us. Bitterness has a way of creeping in it shuts us down physically, emotionally, and spiritually, it will cripple you. It will cripple me. See, bitterness works this way. Maybe, maybe you, maybe, maybe you can relate to this. So hear this. So maybe, maybe this is what bitterness is. Because I'm sure if you're like me, the first thing I ever hear when someone says, Are you a bitter person? I would always say, No, I'm not bitter. I'm I'm happy, I'm excited, I'm joyful. But maybe bitterness creeps into your life like this. Have you ever had imaginary conversations in your head with someone? That like, if I had this conversation, it would go like this. And I would say this. And then they would say that. And then before they knew it, wham, I would drop this truth bomb on them. And it would change their life. And they would leave me alone forever. Imaginary conversations. Maybe we even pick them up and they happen weekly or daily or monthly. Have you ever replayed disagreements in your head? Fights, frustrations you've had with individuals where you've shared words, if it was a, a spouse or a sibling or a roommate, whatever it may be, where you've, displayed, you've replayed the disagreement in your head and, and you begin to find the loopholes in their, their defense and you create new rebuttals. And you almost get a little excited for the next round because you've got new ammunition to, sh to throw. Maybe you just keep replaying a conversation you've had over and over in your head for years, days, months. Maybe bitterness looks like this. You begin to have happiness over someone else's failures. Because you begin to think they deserve it. They earned it. And we begin to celebrate on deep, deep on the inside. Or maybe bitterness looks like this. When you go into one of our local restaurants or stores and, and you see across the aisle someone or you hear their name mentioned and you begin to feel funny, you cringe and all of a sudden you realize there's some animosity, some feelings there. So here's what I want you to do. Take, take a couple of minutes again. Take a couple of minutes in your home or your workplace and, or jump online to one of our hosts, our campus pastors, and, and just ask yourself this. What are the best ways you have found to get past bitterness in your life? And why is it so hard to let go of bitterness? So take two minutes now and talk about this.
See, bitterness can creep in in ways that we never even imagined. It's, it, can, it can harden our hearts. It can, it can change the way we think and the way we act and the way we respond. Well, there's a story that takes place in the Exodus. And as you watched the video that played a, f- a few moments ago, you, you heard the story of Exodus as, as Moses was leading his people out. Some things to kind of keep in mind is that God had called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. They'd been slaves for well over 400 years. And to keep in mind, this is roughly about 2 million people. Ballpark, just estimating around 2 million people Moses is going to lead. And the Israelites did not see being a slave coming. They had been living in this land since the time of Joseph. And all was well. They had come there because of a great famine. And then as Joseph passes away and his brothers had moved on or passed away, now all of a sudden there are new leadership in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, it says this, Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly with them. Or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the Egyptians at that moment in time decide to make the Israelites slaves. And keep in mind that when you are a slave, your life is not your own. Your life's not your own. When and where and what you eat, the task that you have to perform, your bodies, your belongings your children, your spouses, your desires, your education. Whatever you wanted to achieve in your life is over. And when it's generationally, it's passed down over and over time, you become callous to the things you should have been given. Your life now is subject to the owner, to the master. And these slaves, this group of slaves for over 400 years is faced with these decisions that Moses is now asking them to follow him as he leads them through the plagues that had come that God had brought upon Egypt. They're going to follow Moses as he parts the Red Sea. They are going to witness the destruction of Pharaoh's army. And the Israelites are now going to be free. For the very first time in their lifetime, they're going to be free. Here's what I want you to hear today. Learning to live free is hard. Learning to live free is hard. See, at this moment in time, as as God is preparing the Israelites to live the life that he's called for them, that he has desired for them, they are going to have to learn how to live free. And God is using the desert as a space and place and time to teach the Israelites what that means. What does that look like in their life? And he was going to bring them opportunities, educational moments, spiritual maturity moments, wisdom moments to learn to live as free people. Now, you may be thinking, you know, this happened four, five, six thousand years ago. What does this have to do with us? It's, this is what it has to do with you and I right now. We are afforded the same opportunities to learn and to continue to learn what it means to live as free people. So we're going to pick up the story in Exodus 15, verses 22 through 27. And what has happened is we are past the Red Sea, and now it is time. And we kind of see this first occurrence of what happens with the people. It says, Then Moses has led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. And for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them into the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, 
where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. So for three days, for three days, they wandered in the desert without any water. And then when they finally find it, it's not fit to drink. Now keep in mind, we've said this, and you saw this in the video, but they, they had witnessed the plagues. They had, they had seen the Red Sea part. They had witnessed Pharaoh's army drown. But the question still came, why is there not any water? For some reason, they just didn't think God could provide the water to drink. What happens when you and I are learning to live as free people, when you and I are learning to live as free people, we battle what we've been ingrained with in our life, and that is slavery. See, they just couldn't see life any other way because in their old life, water was provided at a certain time. Meals were provided at a certain time. Clothing was provided at a certain time. You worked at a certain time. You didn't get to make any decisions. You didn't get to, you didn't get to have your own viewpoint. It was you do as we tell when we tell you to do it. But God gives them this loving statement. He just kind of gently says, if you listen carefully to me and do what is right in my eyes, if you pay attention to my commands and you keep its decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. See, I am the Lord who heals you. When we've lived as slaves for so long that there is damage, there's bound to be damage. There's bound to be pain. And he says, I got you, and I'll heal you. And this is so important, because as a generational slave beaten for no reason, marginalized, abused, neglected, belittled, lied to, stolen from, Maybe some of this starts to sound more not like a slave situation, but a current situation. Belittled, lied to, stolen from. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you've lost your family. Maybe you've been abandoned. Maybe you've been left. Maybe you've lost your home. It's in these moments when bitterness can creep into our lives, we need reassured that we need to learn some new rhythms, some new rituals, a new way to live. And we get this promise all the way back that the Israelites had, we get the same type of promise, a promise of a new life, and that I'm the Lord who heals you. See, the lesson that God was teaching the Israelites is a lesson we're being taught today. We're dealing with this aftermath of COVID. You and I are dealing with it. And even though we're still in the midst of it, things have evolved, things have changed from March to April to May to June to July. And here we are in August, and it's still changing. But when we start to look at our world, we'll see how things have escalated. If you look back to March 7th and 8th and 9th and 10th, that the whole world, nothing else mattered, but it was all about COVID. Things were shutting down. Businesses stopped going. Schools were sending kids home. We were changing rapidly. But then as, as rhythms changed, as our rituals changed, our frustration levels started to come up. And now we've got all kinds of things. We've got race relations. We've got political circuses going on. The economy is, is, a, is a yo-yo. Jobs, do we have them? Do we not have them? Are we going to keep getting paid? Are we not? Schools and colleges, teachers and educators and coaches and instructors, they've, they've got all kinds of decisions to make. Our arts have changed. Movies, concerts, sports has changed. The church has changed. Going out to eat has changed. And even this past weekend, we can't even go to Chicago. They've drawn the bridges. You can't go downtown. All of our normal rhythms have changed. And when our rhythms and rituals change, our anxiety goes up. Our frustration level goes up. But we have an opportunity to learn from, the, from what's going on. See, I, I'm, I am confident 
I am confident there are people in your life, there's people in my life, you have decided, I I can't deal with it anymore, and you are unfollowing them on social media. But see, we get some taste of some things that we need to make some decisions about. There's some things that you and I have to make decisions about. We get this story from Moses to the Israelites to to the moving on, but we we get to understand that there's more to it. In the New Testament, James talks about it in chapter 3. He talks about what it means to have real wisdom. What kind of life are we really going to live? No matter what else is going on in the world, you and I have to make this decision. It's our opportunity to choose the right answer. I mean, when James talks about in in chapter 3, he talks about what kind of life are you living? Is it going to be good? What is the fruit of your life? What's the fruit of my life? Are we going to be humble? And then he warns people in verse 14. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. That James makes the point, we can't be both wise and bitter. Can't do it. The author of Hebrews goes on. He casts warnings to the church and the believers. In verse 14, he talks about that we are to to live a a life in peace and to live a holy life. In Hebrews 12, he talks about this, that, that we are to live a life of peace and to live a life that is holy. In fact, the author of Hebrews goes on to say, do everything you possibly can to get along with people. we got to ask ourselves. See, I, I, I believe what happens is when you and I are engaging in our world in an unhealthy manner that creates animosity between us, then we've got to ask ourselves, are we living the type of life that brings peace and holiness? Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 15 says this, So see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, I I do everything we can to take care of our yard. I I like to plant flowers. I I like to have them in bloom. I I like to have our yard smelling well and being a part of it. But i got to tell you, no matter how much fabric you put down underneath that mulch, no matter how much you spray, those silly weeds pop up. And you know this. But if all we dare do is just pull off the surface of the weed, if we just maybe cut it, trim it, if we don't get down to the root of the weed, it will only be a few days. And that weed comes back. See, the longer you and I allow bitterness to hang around in our hearts, it will eventually take root in our hearts. The longer we allow it to manifest itself in our lives, the longer we allow it to stick around, the greater the opportunity is to take over. We will not know peace. We will not know true holiness with bitter, with bitterness in our life. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, he says, Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. See, I, I, don't, I don't believe bitterness is just something we overcome. I, I don't think it's just something we can just change by maybe a better discipline or we can work our way out of it. I believe it's more something we are brought through. Bitterness, bitterness is actually mirrors real pain. I, I don't think people are making up their bitterness. But just like the Israelites who had to be delivered out of Egypt, they couldn't figure out how to do it on their own. They were hard workers. They were slaves. They were making bricks to, just with a little bit of straw, some mud. I, I, I mean, they, if they wanted to leave, they outnumbered. They have so, so their population was so high, surely they could have put up some kind of fight. But after 400 plus years, they didn't have it in them. So they just stayed. Bitterness isn't something we just, let's get better at it. Bitterness is something that we have to be delivered from. 
in your homes, in your cars, wherever you're at today, we're going to sing this song as, as our band makes their way to sing this. It's the title of It's Egypt. Let me just read you a few lines here. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, and you held back the waters for my release. So as we get ready to sing this song, I want to pray for you. I want you to just examine yourself. Where are we at right now? As we create new rhythms, new rituals, new patterns, that we deal with this bitterness the right way, that God will deliver you from the very thing that is killing you. Father God, thank you so much for the day you've given us and the opportunity we have to worship you and to celebrate you. The Father, you begin to work on us on the inside out. That you make aware to us, you, you reveal to us the bitterness that we, that we share, that we face. And Father, we understand that you are the one that can deliver us. And I pray now, I pray now that we hear your calling and accept your hand and allow you to pull us through. And we ask these things, your most precious and holy name. Amen.